So it's my pleasure uh, today to introduce Dr. Uh, Jerry Santacora, uh, who is the George and Esther Gross Professor of Psychiatry and Director of the Yale Depression Research Program and Co-Director of Yale's Interventional Psychiatry Program. Dr. Sancora, who is an MD, PhD, uh, his work employs both preclinical and clinical research methodologies and attempts to expand our understanding of the underlying pathophysiology of neuropsychiatric disorders and the diagnostic and treatment approach, uh, approaches. Um, he has served as a principal investigator on numerous NIH foundation and industry sponsored studies, ranging from rodent models of pathogenesis through mechanistic uh, neuroimaging studies, introducing novel methods to assess brain metabolism to large multi-phase center phase three clinical trials. I mean, there must be something about Yale, because I remember when I went for my um, interview for residency there, um, I can't remember which bunny it was. Was Bill Bunny or Steve Bunny? Steve. Was late to the interview with me wearing a lab coat, a white lab coat, and said, I'm sorry I'm late, I just was running a group. So I mean, it's really, um, so Dr. Santacora's personal experience over the arc of this journey has provided him with unique perspectives on the challenges that impede the successful application of neuroscience advances to neuropsychiatric clinical practice and has led him to foster a diverse interdisciplinary collaborative team approach to translational neuroscience. In recognition of uh, his efforts, he recently received the Association for Clinical and Translational Sciences Award for Team Science in addition to previous awards, including the Anna Monica International Award for investigation of the biological substrate and functional disturbances of depression. Now that, that award is given, you have to be under a certain age. I can't remember for that one. That one. That's a very prestigious. Yeah. With, um, uh, Beck. Beck, okay. So it's a very, but that's, that's a very prestigious award. But you also won the Joel Elkey's Research Award for outstanding contributions to psychopharmacology from the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, which is also an extremely uh, prestigious award. Now he has a complicated topic, which is not on the screen. Can you maybe go to the next slide? Uh, arrow. arrow, okay. I just wanna announce his topic. There we go. Um, considering the non-specific effects that contributed to efficacy of interventional treatments, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Jerry Seneca. Thank, thank you very much, Tony. That was a very generous introduction. Um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to get a chance to talk to you. I am really going to talk. Uh, I was mentioning to Dr. Yankas and Rothschild that I'm going to give a talk that's really not my typical CAN presentation where I'm going to talk about translational neuroscience and use of ketamine or other treatments. I'm really going to try to do a, a little, something a little bit different. And uh, really try to, I'm going to try to weave the stories, the science into it, but taking a little bit of a big step back and look at the perspectives of where we are right now and where the field is going, especially in terms of some of these novel interventional treatments that are coming out, just really trying to lay some foundation for us to think about things. Um, I do uh, consult to many companies I and mean, I do have uh, patents and um, uh, other uh, conflicts, you can find any of those. And I will be discussing off-label indications. In fact, pretty much everything I talk about will be off-label, with the exception of one or two things, um, especially ketamine and psilocybin uh, are off-label. Um, but let me just start with this. This is a, a great quote. So this is uh, Plato writing about Socrates' treatment of a headache. And he says, the thing was a certain leaf. But there was a charm to go with the leaf, with the remedy. And if uttered at the exact moment of giving the leaf, basically, you got the result. So this is going way back. This idea that there was one thing, a thing charm. There was the treatment and it went with this. And, and the charm was basically a, a little prayer, a little something that was said along with it. And you did those two things together and you got a response. If you did one without the other, you didn't get the response. And really this is how medicine existed all through the pre-scientific era. You know, there were treatments, nobody really questioned what were the components of the treatment. They kind of all just went together. And remarkably that really lasted for years and years and years. Um, 
Then in the early 20th century, people started to question, well, they started to realize, well, there's response and there's a response to the specific thing, but there are these non-specific effects that, ha that have impact. And for the most part, they were thought to be things like natural history of disease, you know, like otitis media, whether you treat it or not, most kids are gonna get better. Um, it's just the natural history of the disease, the regression to the mean. Most people come to a clinical trial when they're most ill, or they come to a doctor's care when they're most ill. If you just give them time, they're going to typically go back. Or Horthon-like effects. I don't know if you know the Horthon effect, but anytime you're being observed, you behave differently usually, and you or, or you tend to do better. So people started to realize that in the early 20th century, and then by the mid 20th century people did start to, again, realize there was something to the charm. There was something to what really people started to call the placebo effect, that there was something beyond the actual specific drug that was having some, some impact on the response rate. And then more recently, we started to understand that there could be an interaction between the thing and the charm, that sometimes the drug can cause an effect that can actually amplify or, or diminish the placebo response, either cause more of a placebo effect or actually cause a nocebo effect, a negative effect. So that became you know, really uh, grown in popularity in this, in this past quarter century. And now we're at the point where we're starting to realize that there may be a double interaction or a two-way interaction, that both the idea that um, these drugs may some way enhance that placebo response or the placebo response can enhance the effect of the drug. But now we're starting to understand that the actual drugs may change the way you're thinking or the, your expectations of future events. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So that's really, if you look at it, this is gonna be the outline of what we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna to try to take you through a little bit through history of how we're starting to understand how these contextual effects play a much bigger role. So I'll start with, the story of Mesmer. How many people here know Anton Mesmer, the, know the whole story, mesmerization? You probably heard of it. Animal magnetism, you may have used this word before. So it's a really great story. I had sabbatical, took a long time off, and it was great reading these original books from the 1700s and just going through and reading. But this is an incredible story. So Anton Mesmer was an Austrian physician. Um, but while he was in college, he studied physics, and he thought he discovered another force of nature called animal magnetism. Newton re you know, relatively recently had discovered gravity. Benjamin Franklin had discovered electricity or written quite a bit about electricity. Uh, Mesmer thought he discovered a new force of nature called animal magnetism. And he started to believe that it was the malalignment of this animal magnetism in people that caused many of the maladies that were facing them in the late 1700s. He started to develop a treatment where he believed he could realign people's animal magnetism through these magnetic baths, that case that he would develop. Um, he would have metal rods that he'd be able to realign people's animal magnetism. And he started to treat all types of maladies, became incredibly popular among the Parisians. He moved to Paris became extremely popular um, and became very popular with the aristocrats and continued to grow um, in popularity. And at the time, started to actually get into the court of uh, Louis. Louis XVI got, got into his court. He was treating Marie Antoinette, became incredibly popular. And then what started to happen was more and more money started to go to Mesmer's Institute than to the Institutes of Medicine and Science at the big universities. And that really upset them quickly. So then they petitioned King Louis is like, you know, you have to do something. This guy's a charlatan, this isn't real. Um, at that point, people started to get quite upset. And uh, they actually formed, uh, Louis XVI formed two commissions to, to actually say, is this real or is this just some type of hoax? Because now all kinds of money are going in. They're not going into treat, they're not going into the medical societies, which were using the cutting edge techniques of leeches and emetics. So it wasn't that they were really doing what we would consider good medical practice back then, but they were doing regular sort of what they would consider mainstream medicine. 
uh, where he wasn't. So they, they got Louis XVI to form these commissions. So two commissions. One was headed by Benjamin Franklin, who was uh, recently uh, in France, but had recently written his treatise on um, electricity. So he was really pretty amazing guy himself, Benjamin Franklin, really one of the top scientists of the time too. And Lavoisier, so any of you went through chemistry, you remember the famous chemist Lavoisier. So they both headed these two um, commissions to really test. And they were given a very specific mandate to determine if animal magnetism was real or not. And they set up a range of studies, really some of the first placebo-controlled, sham control studies. They, they had people being treated with magnetic rods that weren't magnetic, they had people being treated with actual magnetic rods, but behind a screen where they couldn't know if they were being treated. And they went through for a really thorough examination period of the technique of mesmerization. Mesmer himself refused to partake in it. So it was actually one of his uh, junior colleagues, uh, his mentees, uh, De Salon, who really was the one who, who did the studies. And this was the findings at the end, which was really interesting. So they went through really pretty thorough uh, tests. I want to see if I have the pointer. So basically, they concluded that imagination without magnetism still produces these convulsions. This was these crises is what they would do when they did it. People would start to seize or have pseudo seizures, whatever they were seizing, they would, they would have all these uh, pretty dramatic physiologic effects from it and then report they were feeling better. Um, so they uh, said that imagination without magnetism can still produce the convulsions, but magnetism without imagination produces nothing. And in fact, they went on to write, um, Un invention illusa van e finesse. So I apologize to anybody who speaks French. But basically, it's this is an illusionary, vain, and disastrous in, uh, invention. And they really slammed it hard. Um, Interestingly, this one, the person who was doing it, didn't really deny that this was a big part of it. He kind of said, well, imagination may be a big part of it. In fact, what, what you call imagination may be what we're calling animal magnetism, um, which was interesting. And he said, but we're, I'm seeing these patients really get better. Maybe your commission should try to understand more what this is, this, this effect imagination has. Um, but it's interesting that there was a separate report filed. The first report was published and disseminated all over. The second was one just privately for the king. And in that, they clearly wrote that they believed this was a danger to the medical establishment and society as a whole, and it constituted a regression to superstition and in less enlightened time. So they really slammed it. And if you really go back in history and read, it's so interesting. People like Adams and, and Madison and Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, were really involved in this. And they were writing letters to Benjamin Franklin, really convincing him to publicize this and squash this before it gets to America. They were very concerned that this could be a real threat to the Enlightenment that, that they fought so hard for. Um, so a really interesting time, but it kind of just sets the stage for where we are a little bit now in terms of trying to understand what's the mechanisms of these responses that we're seeing in depression. So then if you just fast forward about 150 years, not much happened in medicine thinking about the nonspecific or placebo-like responses until about 19, late 1930s. First was Henry Thiel up in Minnesota. They were trying to develop a vaccine for the common cold. And they, there were some reports coming out at the time and he did a study where pretty remarkably they were reporting about a 55% reduction in the number of colds people were reporting after getting the vaccination. However, the control group that just got saline reported a 61% decrease in the number of common colds. So it was one of the first reports and Deal really said it was pretty amazing that this happened, but still the, the main conclusion was that the vaccine didn't work. Nobody really picked up on the fact that, well, there was this at least perceived big reduction in the number of colds. The next comes from, these are all names that we probably all should be reading a lot more about, is, is Harry Gold, who a famous cardiologist at the time, um, had a lot to do with the development of many of the basic uh, 
drugs that we still use in cardiology. But at the time, he was investigating xantines. So xantines were compounds that were used. We know they had big vasodilatory effects. They were the standard treatment for people with angina pectoris. So if you had angina, you were getting a xantine. And it was reported to be a pretty good effect until the people started to really study how much of the effect was due to the xantines versus just due to the fact they were given something. And then you know, with, with their studies, uh, Gold Pre uh, clearly demonstrated that the effect was no greater. And in fact, every type of a pain observed, uh, every type of change in pain observed during the use of the xantine was also reported with placebo. But again, he didn't really emphasize the fact that there was a big placebo response. He just said, well, it just shows that the xantines have real no specific effect. This is where we were in the 19, late 1930s. Um, finally, the first person to really start to pay attention to it was um, Henry Beecher, uh, another uh, uh, anesthesiologist um, up in the Boston area, really started to pay a lot of attention to this. And he wrote this first paper that became quite famous at the time, The Powerful Placebo. Um, this is published in 1930, uh, 1930-something, the original one. Um, but 1955 is this reprint. Um, but really here, he looked through all of medicine. Well, all of medicine, meaning he looked at like five different uh, areas of medicine. And he seemed to find this consistent effect of about a 35% placebo response rate, that people even that weren't getting the actual treatments were getting better. Uh, he made a blunder, I think, in, in retrospect. He called it a placebo effect, and we'll talk a little bit. Placebo response is not synonymous with placebo effect, um, but he showed that. Um, but he was really one of the first physicians to really reappreciate the value of the charm of, of saying that there is something more than the specific treatment that's actually impacting outcome. And, and this slide I just put in here, because this really, when I went through the whole thing, this, this amazed me as much as anything. So really, we're into the 1960s, the late 1950s. This idea of what we consider our gold standard running a placebo control trial was still so new. People didn't really understand what placebo control trials. Those first ones were really in the late 1930s. By 1950s, it was still rarely used. Um, and it really wasn't until the year before I was born, 1962, with, with uh, um, the Father Harris Act, that sort of the FDA started to realize, like, oh, it was at, at one of the meetings when they're actually deciding how they were gonna change the FDA regulations for approval of drugs. Um, and they were actually considering, they wanted to have, that you can prove one drug was better than another to get it approved. And one of the famous physicians at the time, Lasagna was up to, called up to testify. And basically when, where they said, well, do you think that companies should be forced to prove their drug is better than an existing drug to get approval. And he kind of just said, well, that's impossible. He said, we can barely prove that they works better than placebo. And that was, you know, shocking to most people. They really had a hard time with that. And that's what, you know, that is eventually what got into the report. Even with this time, it didn't mandate that placebo control trials were done to get FDA approval, but it really became the accepted way of getting studies or getting drugs approved. So it's kind of a background just to give you some idea of you know, what we're talking about, these nonspecific effects and how powerful they can be and how recent in medical history we, we really start to consider these as a separate effect and, and as an important effect. Um, but within psychiatry, how important are these? I, I think sometimes we we're a little too quick to accept this uh, uh, compared to other fields. But this is a really, uh, I think, a very important, should be a very influential paper that came out by Mark Stone about a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, from, from the FDA. And what he did was he took all the trials that were submitted um, from 1979 to 2016 for monotherapy antidepressants. And he wanted to look and see what the response was, you know, how much of how much of an effect it was. So basically, if you added it all up, it looked overall there was about a nine point 
a 9.8 9.8 point change in HMD scores. They adjusted MADRIS to be HMD equivalents, but about a 9.8 difference in, HM, in the HMD score with treatment. There was about an eight point difference in the placebos across. So if you actually look at that, um, you know, there's about, uh, about 82% of that overall effect in those trials could be attributed to what they call contextual not drug specific. So about 18% of that overall response could be specifically attributed to the drug that was given. The other 82% you could say are attributed to other effects. Um, just to be clear, th this is not, I, th I think I, I mentioned, I think we're very quick to say, well, it's a psychiatric illness. You know, it, people are, are more likely to respond to this. We're not. I mean, if you look at others like osteoarthritis, you look at this, the, the, the percent attributable uh, to context is around 80 some odd, 75% overall. Um, in fact, if you look across all these fields, this is a recent paper that came out. Um, if you look at psychiatric disorders, we're kind of in the middle in terms of how sensitive we are to these nonspecific effects. Things like cardiovascular is very high. Um, in fact, if you go back to the old studies by Gold and stuff, he showed cardiovascular uh, angina is very, very sensitive to these nonspecific effects. But you can look across all of the fields and pretty much everything, except for anesthesia. Anesthesia had, a lo had the lowest of them all. Um, but, it, but also, if you look, people say, well, it's really because we're asking, we're not asking objective measures. We're just asking how you feel, and that's going to be sensitive. That doesn't look to be true either, because when you look at these, some of the most objective, like survival, actually has some of the highest nonspecific effects. And that's because there's probably many things that affect survival in these cancer studies other than the specific drug. Um, or if you look at some of these semi-objective measures, they're pretty good. The things that don't seem to respond much to these nonspecific effects are, are, are things like biochemical assays. So your biochemistry doesn't seem to have a big effect, but functional outcomes of all different types seem to have a very large nonspecific effect. So then we come to this point talking about the efficacy paradox. And this is a world, this is part of what got me very interested in this, is this idea that um, you know, it, studies with randomized placebo-controlled trials, and it's where we've really moved to in the field, is we look at the delta between the active and placebo, and that's how the FDA determines if a drug's going to be approved. It's what's the delta. It doesn't matter if, you know, people only get 5% better, but if on placebo they only get 3% better, that's still likely to be statistically significant, and may, drug may get approved, even though very few people are benefiting from it as opposed to cases in clinics where you're seeing a lot of people get better, but it may not be so separable from the placebo. And this is a really tricky thing when you start to think about how, how do you approve drugs? Do you care how many people are getting better? Or do you care that it's working specifically better than the placebo or the, or the sham? Um, and, you know, and there's actually a, a lot of interaction because the higher the effect is, the higher the placebo usually is. So it becomes really difficult to separate this. And I just want to give some examples. This is looking at the data for S-ketamine, intranasal S-ketamine. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. This is IV ketamine was originally developed. IV ketamine itself was FDA approved in 1970 as an anesthetic, but after you know a few decades of of evidence showing that it had um, effect in treating mood, uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals ran these trials looking at S-ketamine intranasally. Uh, and this was, this was the first trial. This was uh, fixed dose, so two doses, point, uh, 56 mg um, dose or 84 milligram dose of intranasal versus uh, a saline Placebo. This is all done. I don't know if you remember, these studies were done. These were the FDA uh, trials that were submitted. Um, they were all done with the addition of a new medicine. So it wasn't, nobody really got placebo. Everybody at least got a brand new medicine. These are all treatment resistant depressed patients. Everybody got a new oral antidepressant. And then on top of that, you either randomized to placebo intranasal spray 
84 or 56 milligrams. And here you can see the drop in, um, here they're using the Madras score. So you're seeing about a 19 point drop um, with the two doses, but you're still getting almost a 14 point drop with the placebo. And in this case, it actually didn't reach significance. So in this study, so you'll hear about this, only one study was significant in, in the FDA package that Janssen presented. This one didn't reach significance the way it was set because the 84 milligram had to be looked at first and that barely missed. So it, so it didn't hit the significance. But if you look at the response, over 50% responding to both doses, about 35 to 40% uh, meeting remission, but in the group that got the new antidepressant um, with just the saline, you know, over 30%, which is about twice what you would expect, more than twice what you would expect to see from the STAR-D data. Um, and these, these were pretty sick people, but these people were getting really intense follow-up care. They would come in at least twice a week to get the intranasal spray, even the people that were just getting the nasal saline. The second study was significant, um, and this was a flexible dose, so it wasn't fixed. So they could either start with 56 and go to 84 versus the placebo. So this, you can see they're almost identical. If you look at the, the point drop, they're both about 19 point drop for the, for the actual drug. And about 14, in this case, I think it was closer to 12 for the placebo. Um, but now you look at response and remission rates. So you're seeing response rates, so almost 70%, which is pretty good for treatment-resistant depressed patients um, and over 50% getting into remission. Um, but you're still seeing about 30% getting into remission, which is still twice as high as the STAR-D would have suggested, um, even with a placebo. So you start to think, you know, what else is going on here? And you start to realize it's much more complicated. The, the last study of getting back to the esketamine is actually looking at the suicide. So these are patients with suicidal ideation. Um, so these people were all recruited. I don't know if, how many people are familiar with these studies, the phase two, but then the two phase threes. They were recruited through emergency rooms or through inpatient units. Uh, only patients that were going to be hospitalized because of suicidal ideation were enrolled. And then once enrolled, they had to initiate a new form of oral treatment. So basically, they had to get something else, anything except for an MAOI or ECT. Um, and they were allowed to have partial hospital programs. They were all started as inpatients, but they can transition out. Or they were randomized to get the, uh, I've, the intranasal esketamine or placebo. And you can see here, uh, these all were statistically significant, especially at the short time, which is what the primary outcome measure was. Um, and now you start to look at the remission and response rates, which are really pretty, pretty remarkable if you look here. At the end of a month, and remember, these are people that were hospitalized with suicidal ideation. You're getting uh, um, rates of remission rates of over 50% or about a little bit less here, but on average, about 50% remission rates with the treatment at the end of a month. But again, about 35, close to 40%, even if you got the saline. So it just, I think there's two things to learn. One, it really does look like the treatment makes a difference. But even just giving very good care without using esketamine, people did much better than you would expect. All right, so getting, getting to that point, let's just talk a little bit about what, what constitutes, when we talked about this, proportion attributed to context. You know, if there's um, the actual specific effect but then there's a, the rest of it would be what's called uh, context-dependent or the proportion attributed to context. And the long understood things are, we, we talked briefly about the natural progression of the disease. So people are going to get better or get worse over time, no matter what happens. Um, there's always a regression to the mean. People always come for treatment or typically come for treatment when they're at their worst. So just by chance, the, the odds are they're going to start feeling better, even if this is a fluctuating illness. If you get them at the peak, they're probably going to get better over time. And then the other we talked about is this Horthon effect. And I think a lot of this is what we saw in those studies. You bring them in, you know, it's, it's called standard of care treatment, but those of you doing clinical research trials know it, it, 
I don't know what standard of care that is when you're calling somebody every single day, you're following them. I evaluate somebody for five, six hours at a time. If that's standard of care, that you're getting good care. Um, so I think you're getting a, a different level of care just simply by being part of a study. Um, and, and then the, and it's really hard to know how much of an effect is due to all of that versus the placebo effect. Uh, some of the best ways of looking at that is looking at uh, wait lists, which itself has some problems, um, but looking at how people are the sort of the natural history and following up. There, there are some good studies uh, being done at Columbia looking at this. Um, and basically, they, they're, they're estimating about one third of the response is probably due to these more uh, nonspecific effects that don't really involve the placebo. Just anybody being followed closely for a period of time will show about a third of the response rate. But then the rest of it is really due to what is more classically considered the placebo effect. And that has several components of it. And I'll, I'll just keep, keep it to the simplest level. People, we believe that it has a lot to do with expectations. What the patient and the clinician expect to, to have happen um, it has to do with conditioning. The classic example is you have a headache for 30 years of your life. You take some ibuprofen and your headache goes away. The next time you don't, you get a saline pill, but you're just so used to taking that ibuprofen. You just expect your condition to believe that's your, your condition to believe that that's going to have an effect. And there is really good evidence that conditioning plays a large role. And the last part of it is this therapeutic alliance, the actual alliance between the patient and, and, and the provider or the caregiver, that they really interact together to have these effects. So if you start to look at it, you really start to think that now you have your specific drug effect, but you also have a large placebo effect, and then you have the other nonspecific factors. So when you start thinking about where you're having an impact on the overall treatment, the actual specific drug effect is a relatively small component in and of itself. Yeah, but you, you can't really strip that away without impacting all these other features either, or at least without impacting the, the placebo effects. And again, this is just a reminder that it's not just, I keep coming back to that, not just in depression, because one of the dangers by me talking about this is I think people get the idea, well, these aren't real illnesses. These, you know, that's why people respond to that. That's I keep coming back to this because that's not the case. It's pretty much across medicine we see this. All right. Um, in pain, there's been a lot of work, and this is talking about the expectation part of it. So I don't know if the, this is the, the hidden or concealed treatment. Um, and it was some really interesting work uh, by Benedetti uh, in Italy and Luana Coloca doing some of this early work, but really interesting work where they have people uh, with uh, various pain syndromes, treating them uh, with either buprenorphine, tramadol, uh, ketolorac, or, or, or uh, metasmazole, um, and showing that if you tell them, all right, they're in, they're in there with an IV hooked up, if you tell them, I'm going to give you the medicine now, you'll get a certain amount of pain reduction. But if they're hooked up to the IV and you serotipitously, right, that's a tough word, right? Um, if you just give it to them without them knowing, the pain response is always less. And they've shown that across the fields. Um, interestingly, you can do it the other way around too. Uh, this is looking at post-op anxiety using diazepam, Valium. Uh, by, uh, by telling somebody you're giving them the Valium, you get a much better response than by giving it to them without telling them. Um, and then the reverse, by telling them you're gonna stop it, <laughs> um, they get the anxiety back much more than if you don't tell them you're gonna stop it. And then even in Parkinson's disease, you can get very similar by turning on the stimulation on DBS. Telling them you're going to turn it on, you get a much bigger response. And telling them you're going to turn it off, you get a much bigger decrement in the response than if you just do it in a concealed fashion. So these are some really important ways of showing that expectations can play a significant role. Um, this became uh, a big issue uh, because I don't know how many of you saw this paper by... Uh, Boris Heifetz from Stanford published this, doing some really interesting work in Stanford um, a, a few months ago, looking at patients that were going to be going for surgery, uh, but then seeing, well, what if we gave ketamine? Because one of the questions is, well, is people just getting better from ketamine because they know they're taking it? 
you know, th this um, functional unblinding. I'm not sure if everybody's, you know, these randomized placebo controlled trials are supposed to be blinded, uh, meaning that people don't know, the physician don't know what they're giving them and the patient don't know what they're getting. In reality, there's functional unblinding for pretty much every medicine um, that people can usually guess. And, and physicians can usually guess based on the side effect profile or something else. So this is a, a study aimed at trying to understand that a little bit better, where Boris, Boris is actually an anesthesiologist there, who uh, gave them the ketamine, a sub-anesthetic dose of ketamine, uh, but while they were under anesthesia for a surgery with other anesthetics. And he wanted to see, well, are people, people with depression, they were all people with depression, but if you gave them the ketamine while they were asleep under anesthesia, would they know it or would they feel any better? Um, and so at, at one day out, which was the primary outcome measure, 50% of the ketamine group uh, reported a remission. 35 in the placebo group reported a remission. Um, overall, you could see not really much different. Pretty similar, big effect, whether they got the actual ketamine or they got simple uh, placebo, which they, gave them, they scored a little bit of... Uh, saline in. Um, you can see the majority of people guess that they did get ketamine, whether they did or didn't get it. Uh, you can see their guess distribution here, but really the biggest effect um, wasn't related to whether they got ketamine or not. I, I wrote a, a, a rebuttal to this here you know, because it really does speak a lot about expectations. There were a lot of problems with this study. Um, and I think Boris would agree that you know, first of all, that we believe the, the basic mechanism, the real physiologic mechanism may require an increase in glutamate, uh, glutamate surge. While you're under anesthesia, you're probably not going to get that. Uh, you know, the, the, the other anesthetics are actually blocking that. It's even evidence if you give enough ketamine to get you to an anesthetic stage, it doesn't have an antidepressant response. Clearly in rodents, you know, more ketamine actually blocks the antidepressant-like response. So there's some good reasons to think that, you know, there, there may be pure pharmacologic mechanistic reasons, pharmacodynamic reasons why it wouldn't work. But it's also a very small group. This is a group going for surgery, so people feel better after getting surgery. It's not a typical depressed group of patients. Um, and they also asked, you know, they didn't ask immediately after getting, they asked later on. So there are some problems with the study. But I think their real take-home message from the study was, if you look at the MADRAS score change, this is two weeks out, between the, the 19 patients that got ketamine or the placebo, there was really no difference. But if you look over here and you look at, based on what the patient thought they got, there were big differences. Those that thought they got ketamine did significantly, they had a, a much lower MADRAS score than those that either thought they got placebo or thought they got, uh, they didn't know what they got. So just, there is evidence that that expectancy or that belief is playing a role. This is another large study that we, that we just were part of and just completed. This was a, a, a patient center outcome research institute study, uh, looking at 400 people uh, randomized to either get ECT or get IV ketamine. And the way this was devised was patients that were referred to the programs. So uh, there were five programs. It was us at Yale, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Baylor, Mount Sinai, and Johns Hopkins. So the five of us, patients that were referred to our programs for consideration for ECT, were asked if they were willing to be randomized to either get ECT or to get IV ketamine. Um, and it would be three weeks of ECT or three weeks twice a week, three weeks of three times a week ECT or three weeks of twice a week ketamine. And you can see at the end, here, here's the, the overall results. Uh, this was a non-inferiority study. So meaning we weren't trying to see if one was, well, we were just trying to see is ketamine non-inferior to ECT? Is, is it close at least in response to ECT? You know, the data from this study, and it's important to realize these were non-psychotic treatment-resistant depressed patients. Uh, we can talk a lot more about this if we have some time at the end, the, the meaning of this study. Um, but clearly showed that ketamine was non-inferior to ECT in this non-psychotically depressed group of patients. Um, and you can actually look at the change scores here over time, whether you use the quids, which is the self-report, or the madras, which is 
the uh, clinician rated scale. Um, pretty interesting, but coming back to this idea of expectation or patient preference, we sought to look at some of the secondary measures. And one of the things that we started to do, unfortunately, after the study was about one third done, we started to really ask patients, well, what did you want to get? Um, you know, we asked the patients, what was your preference? Um, it, you know, they, they didn't have a choice, they were randomized, but at the end we asked them, what did you actually want to get? So again, a lot of problems with this study. It, it was initiated after one third of the patients were already recruited. The question was asked after you know, the measures were done and that was done because we didn't want to interfere with, with the patient's responses. But you can see the response rates to, to, um, to ketamine. So these are all the patients that got treated with ketamine. Those that said they preferred ECT only had about a 20% response rate. Those that said they really didn't have a strong choice, this was a Likert scale, one and two being I strongly preferred ketamine, moderately, pre I mean, strongly preferred ECT, moderately preferred ECT, somewhat preferred ECT, neutral or uh, somewhat preferred uh, ketamine, moderately preferred ketamine or strongly preferred ketamine, if that makes sense. You know, so you measure in the... So for those that either moderately or strongly preferred ECT, only about 20% of them responded to the ketamine. For those that were neutral, either saying they moderately preferred one or the other, or, and um, mildly preferred one or the other, or neutral, at about a 45%. And those that preferred ketamine actually had close to a 60%. Um, now again, a lot of problems with this study. We asked after the question, it was a post-hoc study, but this was you know, 100 and, I'm trying to remember, 140, 150 people. It's, it's a decent sized study to look at this. Uh, interestingly for ECT, it didn't make a difference. So it was a 40% response rate, regardless what they preferred, um, which shows that there may be some contextual effects involved here. But if you look at adverse events, and you can look at the adverse events that were reported here, you know, there were more adverse events reported with ECT probably would be expected. Um, but the main point here is there was no effect on the primary outcome measure of improvement with uh, preference, but there was an effect on what percent of people reported having an adverse event with ECT. So those that said they preferred ECT had a little bit more than, than a 20%, 20, uh, I think it was 26% um, of them reported some adverse event but those that said they actually wanted ketamine are reporting over 40% of over 40% of them are saying they had an adverse event. So it goes both ways and it's very contextual. Of, it may not just be everybody has the same type of nonspecific effect to every drug. It could be very contextual. It makes life very difficult when you start to think about how to use this information in either treating patients or how to design clinical trials. The last part is this idea of conditioning. And conditioning is really important. Uh, I mentioned before, if you took ibuprofen for 30 years and it works to get a headache down, the next time you take a sugar pill by accident, there's very likely your headache is going to get better. And there's a lot of evidence suggesting that, head, that, uh, that conditioning plays a major role in treatment response. Um, and even in rodents, this is some evidence showing that ketamine, after giving ketamine a few times to a rat in a specific cage, the next, you can take them the third time out, put them in the cage without giving ketamine and you still get an antidepressant-like response. So it's just this evidence of ketamine-like um, effects. These become a real big issue. We, we just started a new PCORI study. We're actually doing a head-to-head -head comparison of IV ketamine versus intranasal ketamine. Um, because the question is always out there, is intranasal as good or better than the IV? Um, we're, we're actually doing that study head to head. But we really understand that the expectancy plays a big role because I think people are coming into this with pretty strong beliefs. Some people believe that one is better than the other. In fact, we see a lot of patients, they come in and say, my doctor said only the IV works. So we realize expectancy could have a lot. And then the other part is who do we allow in the study? Do we allow patients that already had one treatment or another because then conditioning is gonna have a big effect. So it's really important uh, things to think about. Um, the last part of it is the therapeutic alliance. And I, I just want to go through this really quickly because it's the last part of the sort of uh, placebo effects or contributed to placebo effects. 
And for this, I'll actually go back to 1961. I don't know about dating anybody, but Tony, have you ever read Jerome Frank's books? Uh, not in 61. I didn't. I wasn't. I wasn't assuming that. <laughs> I didn't ask you about Mesmer, but <laughs> but um, but Jerome. Um, so uh, so Jerome Frank back then was really interested in what sort of the core features of psychotherapy. What what is it? He would argue that it doesn't really matter what type you use; they're all about the same. There are certain core features that that are really critical. Uh, and he went through and he started to say that there are these four things that they could pick out. And one is an emotionally charged experience with a confiding relationship uh, with somebody who's perceived to be a helping person. The other is a healing setting. You feel that you're in a healing setting. The third really is a, a, a rational uh, or a rationale for, for this to work, some conce conceptual schema that people believe. So a story like this, the, this is what's wrong with you. And this is how this treatment is going to fix it. And then the other is some type of ritualistic process. And he really, you know, is his idea that this is really what psychotherapy could be distilled down to these four main components for an effective psychotherapy. And what I argue is so many of our interventional treatments are you know, sort of the epitome of, of using all of these. Um, in terms of being emotionally charged uh, with a confiding uh, relationship, you know, the treatments we're giving, either ECT, ketamine, now psilocybin, incredibly emotionally charged uh, in, in so many ways. Um, the, the, the level of stress people are going through, the actual drugs itself, increasing emotionality dramatically, uh, really very unique in, in that sense, and, and also very much done with a close relationship with a provider, uh, whether it's uh, ECT where you're, you're there physically with that person uh, at the time, or it's something like psilocybin where there's a person, uh, either a facilitator or whatever you call the person with you or the two people with you, very close relationship. The other is a healing setting. And we can argue that these treatments, whether it's TMS, whether it's an ECT suite, um, really depends on what your view of a healing setting is. Uh, for many people, this would be considered a, the ideal of a healing setting, a very medicalized setting. For other people, it could be much more a psychedelic type setting, uh, considered a healing setting. Or at the time when Jerome Frank was writing the book, was it a couch with some, a chair? You know, it's this idea of what is considered a healing setting. But I think these interventional treatments are incredibly uh, powerful in presenting these unique settings. The other is some rational conceptual scheme. And I, my typical talk, what I normally talk about is sort of the neurobiology of this, of this idea that we have synaptic plasticity occurring with these treatments, that drugs like ketamine or ECT or psilocybin are inducing these rapid changes in spine density on that they're allowing synaptic plasticity and brain adaptation to occur. That, that's a really nice story. And I use it all the time with my patients. I, I show them this data all the time. I show them this figure all the time, the new spines being generated within a day, because it's really powerful and it, it really builds a strong story. Um, but for other people, the story could be much more of a metaphysical story or you know, the people believing that you know, these are some other level of expression or understanding that can be achieved through psychedelics and these so really two sides of the same coin in my mind you know it's a story that that we have that we're using to treat and the last is this ritualistic um type procedure and you can argue that all of these intervention treatments are extremely ritualistic um, whether it's uh, a psychedelic treatment whether it's somebody getting ECT or TMS it's a very close relationship that requires both the patient and the physician to participate in it so really unique you have to be an NPO you have to do all these things it's a it's a big ritual that goes with that so if you think about what the the psychotherapists back 50 years ago 60 years ago were saying these interventional treatments kind of fit that perfectly to the extreme um, and then generally, if you start to think about what all these factors are, if you start to put them together, 
you know, all the individual things, the patient characteristics, the clinical characteristics that go into therapeutic alliance. Uh, you start to think about things like set and setting that are very common um, ways of thinking of it, especially in the psychedelic literature. Um, you start to realize that treatment response is really complicated. And you know, this idea that these specific effects, the effect of the drug is really the main thing, I've become convinced is a very naive view. Yeah, there are so many other things that go in there that carry so much weight. And the real exciting thing are the interaction terms. You know, how these expect, uh, expectation, conditioning, treatment alliance actually interacts with the specific effects are really pretty amazing. If you start to think of how to break it down, I do a lot of clinical trial design, a lot of consulting to companies. It's, it's complicated. I, I wish I could say, oh no, this is how you solve what's called a placebo problem is these high placebo response rates. It's not simple because I think it is so contextual. You may solve it for one study, but it may not work at all for the next. This is the last uh, study I wanted to talk about. I'm looking at the time. This was a recent psilocybin study that we participated in. This was a study sponsored by USONA Institute. Very clear effects of psilocybin. A, a 19 point change, uh, six weeks out. Um, uh, and this is by a blinded reader. Uh, you can see that was about the same as the effects we were seeing with ketamine at the same time, but this was after only a single dose of psilocybin. Niacin was used as the placebo control or as the control, not necessarily placebo control, uh, because it couldn't generate some flushing and it was hopeful that it would, you know, in some way mask. I could tell you, not everybody knew what they got, but for me, that was pretty amazing. I, I can tell you there clearly were patients that we didn't know what they got and they didn't know what they got, but the large majority can guess pretty, pretty accurately. But here's a, the separation. Without a doubt, the treatment worked and, and lasted for six weeks. I mean, really impressive. I, I, I was a real skeptic going into this, um, without a doubt. And you can look at this, a waterfall plot, looking where they started, where they ended up at the end of treatment between psilocybin or, or niacin, really pretty impressive response. The question really is, what's driving it? If you look at how these studies are performed, you know, pe pe these people were randomized, they go to baseline, they have these prep sessions that can last six to eight hours where you sit and you talk to the facilitators that called in this case, that's gonna be with you. So you really have a lot of time to change what's called the set, is somebody's mindset, how they're thinking about things. Then they have a treatment that lasts for several hours, um, uh, six to eight hours. And then they have integration sessions after, so you can really build on that. Um, this is a unique way of really combining these treatments in, in a really well thought out way. It's not just giving a treatment and giving psychotherapy on the side. These are really integrated treatments, combining the ability to manipulate expectations, conditioning, um, therapeutic alliance, and, and with the interaction of the actual drug. And that's really uh, sort of to wrap it up where my real interest is now is how do you put this all together? We're at a unique time where we have to start to think about how this works uh, in terms of acknowledging that expectations conditioning play a huge role, a huge role. Um, but also the drug has a major effect. And in the unique case for psychedelics and whether you include ketamine in it or even ECT is they do induce large amounts of brain adaptation or plasticity. So you actually have a chance of rewiring some of these. And there's already some studies suggesting that you can actually change expectations with the treatment. So expectations of future events could be changed more than just conditioning, but the way people view the future. And it could be because of some of these actual uh, neuroplastic changes that we're seeing. So it's a unique time in psychiatry to actually sort of combine these treatments. Um, we're trying to do this in very controlled ways by looking at the combination of CBT with ketamine. And this is uh, one study that uh, Sam Wilkinson has now as a large R01 uh, looking at this. Um, and then there's another study that we're doing with the Michael J. Fox Foundation in Parkinson's disease using ketamine. But really the important thing is showing that we can maintain that response using cognitive behavioral therapy, specifically fashion for Parkinson's disease after it. So I think we're at a real interesting time. I'll make sure I leave time for questions to think about things a little bit differently. Instead of just giving the drug, how do they really interact? And I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, I think I'll, I'll ask the first question. You know, we, we actually were a site here for the s ketamine and we're currently a site for Compass's uh, psilocybin study. Yeah. But I've been, you know, now that I've done a few patients, I'm double blind. Um, yeah. I'm really concerned about uh, the blinding in these psychedelic trials. I mean, I, I had one subject recently who said to me at the end, I didn't get it. You know, and then I, I started to wonder whether what effect her belief is that she didn't get it. And that may may push the drug placebo difference. I mean, it, it, an advantage to the drug. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm worried. Do you have any sense of what the FDA is going to think about all this? I mean, because, you know, if I was designing, the, no one asked me what I thought. But yeah. but I, if I, I would have given people in the placebo groups, like maybe midazolam. You know, because then you'd feel out of it, feel and, of it and you and you'd have, no, <laughs> you'd have you'd feel out of it for maybe fifteen minutes or so, as opposed to six hours or four hours with psilocybin, right? Yeah. Um, I, I I mean, this is this is a big thing that that's what I was talking about, sort of the paradox, the efficacy paradox, where we run into how much does it matter, and this is a tough thing. I, I mean, is our chemotherapy trials blinded? I mean, one group their half falls out and the other it doesn't, but we don't question that so much. Um, it, it's a real struggle. I mean, it's the scientific, and that's why I presented that whole thing with Mesmer in the beginning. Um, and I really think, you know, we have to be careful not to fall into that same trap of being so caught up in our scientific principles that we don't think about what's best for the patients overall. Um, I don't I don't have solutions to it that I just want to present it as something we need to think about. The blinding is not sufficient. I mean, in these studies, it's clear people are going to guess. But even was olanzapine really blinded in the olanzapine? I mean, you couldn't guess who is getting olanzapine. I mean, in, in most trials, you, people can usually guess. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I was thinking this is a great way to explain to the residents why we don't teach only about medications, but also about psychotherapy and how to provide patient-centered care. But then I was thinking about the potential use of AI in providing psychiatric services, and I was wondering what were your thoughts of how would that play a role in the response, if you have any. So I I, I really had to skim through the whole portion Um where it talked about what are some of the key principles that go into therapeutic alliance. I, I'm my PhD is in biophysics. I, I skipped psychotherapy classes. I don't know how to do psychotherapy. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I have grown a huge appreciation for it. So I, I, I I'm not proud of saying I don't know how to do it, but I, I'm acknowledging I don't know how to do it. But there are people that do know how to do it. Um, you know, the, those core features, a big part of it seems to be the perception of compassion uh, and the perception of competence. Um, the, the data that's out there seems to be that. That's sort of a critical component. Um, so I don't know how, how AI can do that. It may do it very well, but I think we need to test that. Does a patient have a sense of compassion? Does a patient have a sense of competence that, that this program is actually better than than my doc anyway, so I'm going to trust that. I, I think we need to really do those studies to see. Thank you for the stock. Um, I was wondering about getting around that placebo issue with things like the psychedelics. To what extent is, are like would dose dependent response trials be useful? Like giving a certain dose to th this group and a higher dose to this group and comparing that way when both groups would probably know that they got something. So th that's a great idea. Does everybody understand what the question is? Instead of just having a placebo, having variable doses. And Tony, I think that answers a little bit of your question. I think the FDA is going to like to see that a little bit to get at it. I think it's good, but I think you still, if you really want to know, I mean, sometimes you may not really want to know. If you really want to know how much the functional unblinding is impacting it, I think the most important thing to do is have a guess question. And that's something I think the FDA is really going to have to struggle with. Do you put a guess question in there? And in, in other words, ask the patient, what do you think you got? And ask the clinician, what do you think you gave? 
um, that's going to be important. Um, but would you not approve a drug if everybody guessed they got it and they got better? I mean, that, you know, from a scientific perspective, you say, well, yeah, there wasn't a drug, it was everything else, but you can't get that effect unless you give the drug. So it, it's tricky. But so I, I think it is going to be the way of going, but you still, I could tell you the difference between one milligram of psilocybin and 25 milligrams of psilocybin. People can tell the difference. 10 milligrams, 25 milligrams, maybe not, but you have to ask. And, and it's not just, do you think you got the drug or not? It's how confident are you? And that, you know, some of the better um, scales that address the guess isn't asking what you got, but how confident are you that you got the active drug? Or you got the high dose of the act, or you got the dose that you thought was going to be effective. That's probably the best question. Thank you. So two quick questions. One, it's also, your talk also made me think about the undesired effects of medications and whether patients believe they have a side effect from the medication or not may be actually irrelevant. If they're saying it, it may actually affect the efficacy of the treatment yeah. and using the reverse logic. The, the second question is, do you have any ideas about how we we fund studies looking at this in a more positive light when we think about how so many of our studies are financed and, and paid for? Is there a way to look at some of these contextual effects and expectations that we could get funded and actually study independently? So that, for me, that's really my main interest for doing these type of talks is to try to open it up. It, it's really, it's a complicated thing. And one of my mentors, when I told him I was starting to write some papers on this. We have some studies going on in this. The advice was, don't do this. There's no good that's going to come out of this. Okay. Um, and I think the fear, the fear is always going back to Thomas Jefferson's concern is, this is going to make people believe that medicines don't work. You do have people very strongly saying, well, antidepressants barely work. They, you know, they, you know, they only work that much better than the placebo. They don't really work. That's the wrong message. The message is that there's, it's a complex, multi-component response. And you don't get any of the benefit if you don't give the drug. And, and that's kind of the way you need to think of it. It isn't like people would get better without giving the drug. Um, but how do you get that message across and how do you get people to fund it? The NIMH has not been a big funder of placebo-like effects, although I think they have some more interest in that, but traditionally not a big funder. Uh, other institutes within the NIH is more willing to fund this. Um, but I think that, I think it's opening a rational discussion about this is important. It, it's not all or nothing. It's not like by saying this, you're saying the real treatments don't work. And again, I don't really have a great solution. I think opening the conversation is the main thing at this point. All right, well, the hours late, we have to stop because you have another um, appointment. So thank you very much, Jerry. Very, very, very interesting.